All right, another daily devotions. It is June 18th, and today we look at Psalms 26 through 31. So uh, Psalm 26, it's a prayer for deliverance. It echoes a lot of Psalm 1, you know, the emphasis on avoiding um, the company of evildoers and how they behave, and also the emphasis on the moral requirements needed to enter into God's presence. Uh, the psalm may have originated as a prayer of someone facing some kind of formal indictment, uh, but now is used uh, for anyone who is feeling uh, unfairly judged or rejected by others. So there's two main themes that dominate this poem. The first is the assertion of innocence. The psalmist asks God to judge him or her. Judge me, God, not anyone else. You judge me. Uh, sounds like Job, right? Uh, you guys are all judging me. No, I want God to judge me. I want God to tell me what God has done. Um, and you get many metaphors here. Uh, walking, in, walking in integrity, walk, not wavering, walking faithfully, having a pure heart, not sitting with evildoers. Uh, and it's these kinds of things, these kinds of ideas the psalmist uses to assert his innocence. The psalmist isn't claiming to be sinless uh, in the absolute sense. He's not saying I have done nothing wrong and I'm perfect. But in regard to specific charges, he is declaring his in innocence. The second theme has to do with uh, the body and bodily postures. The psalmist walks in integrity and faithfulness, uh, asks God to test the heart, does not sit with the wicked, washes, hand, washes his hands in innocence, moves around God's altar, is not like those whose hands are full of evil, and he has his feet planted on upright ground. You almost get the impression that he wants to say, my body is upright and right, and it's, re my, it's reflected in how I live my life. Um, <clears throat> and the point is here is that God's righteous way is one that people uh, are to follow. So that's Psalm 26. Uh, Psalm 27, uh, it's often been wondered if Psalm 27 is really a unity or a composite of, of uh, a couple of different, different poems that now have been put together. Uh, the first half of the poem appears to be a song of trust in the midst of a uh, military, military threat. The second half appears to be a prayer uh, for help of one suffering false accusations and perhaps even family betrayal. It's possible that these uh, two portions were written independently, uh, but trust and petition really aren't all that different, are they? Um, every psalm uh, that we read that talks about trust will assume some kind of immediate threat, um, and uh, every prayer for help um, always, always uh, includes, or almost always includes, uh, a reference to trust. So I'm not sure that we have to believe this psalm to have been originally two independent uh, portions put together. It doesn't matter one way or another, but it is just interesting to think about how these two themes really do go together. Uh, the opening metaphor in the psalm is of God as my light, and it only occurs here in the Old Testament, which is interesting when you think uh, of the connection of light and how the New Testament, particularly uh, John, connects God to light. But here is the only reference to God as, um, as one's light. Um, you also get here the themes of seeking and inquiring uh, of God's face. And again, the face meaning being in the presence of God, knowing who God is, to seek God's face is to, is to seek to know God as much as is humanly possible. Um, so there's an intentional journey here uh, in what the psalmist is saying. And uh, so the psalm ends again with putting his trust in God. Um, psalm 28. So we have a prayer for help, um, a petition, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the person who is uh, 
Writing the psalm is caught between God and a hostile community. Uh, the psalm uh, uh, wants God to uh, end his divine silence by not only rescuing the psalmist from, from what seems to be a desperate situation, but also imposing judgment on those who persecute the psalmist. So we've got a dual wish here, to be rescued and to have enemies judged. Um, so uh, the poem employs a couple of different plays on words. Uh, first, you get uh, uh, the petitioner who lifts hands to God in the sanctuary, in God's sanctuary, in petition and praise, and also a request uh, at the end of the psalm that God would be Israel's shepherd and lift them out of danger. And then you get the closing request that God shepherd the people. Um, and here we also have a play um, uh, because the petitioner has earlier complained about enemies working evil, even as they speak peace with their neighbor, false shepherds, so to speak. All right, Psalm 29, a uh, hymn of praise. And here we got a lot of symbolism in the psalm, a lot of mythological symbolism. Now, remember the word myth. We, we, the, the word myth is, is misused and not understood today. The word myth just comes from a Greek, uh, Greek, uh, Greek word mythos, and it means sacred story. Any story that is sacred a religious story. The parable of the Good Samaritan is a mythos. It's a sacred story. Um, now, sacred stories uh, don't have to be true. They, they could be uh, uh, works of fiction, but they have become sacred stories in the life of a community. A mythos can also be true. Jesus is a sacred story. The story of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection is a mythos, but it's not a fictional mythos, right? It is, it is true reality. It is Jesus indeed uh, comes to us in history. So when I say symbol, mythic symbolism, I'm not casting any kind of aspersions on this psalm and its language, just trying to make a point about the language of this psalm in its context, okay? So um, you get the symbolism that without ears to hear, the poem falls on deaf ears. Uh, you get this idea uh, in verse one that God is surrounded by lesser heavenly beings, uh, the counsel of God, that God has a counsel. We saw that in Job chapter one. Um, and some of those, uh, some of those who counsel, uh, God might even be hostile to God. Um, and uh, the Lord, the Lord earns his powers. Is the, or, I'm sorry, the Lord earns his lordship by defeating the powers, the powers of chaos, uh, which here is portrayed by the water and the flood. Now, we don't really get the image of chaos in Genesis 1 around the water, although when we do get the earth was up without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep, there's, there's some chaos there, a churning, bubbling thing. But also in creation accounts in the ancient world, in the ancient Near East, Egyptian, Babylonian, Sumerian, uh, certainly creation comes out of chaos, out of disorganization. In other words, what, what you get is you've got a disorder in creation and God orders it, okay? So um, Psalm 29 is the hymn that celebrates the powers of God over these uh, uh, or, or celebrates the Lord's victory over the powers of chaos. And um, the psalm ends in, in uh, speaking of God's glory. And we get in seven times uh, the use of the phrase voice of the Lord. Um, and uh, he triumphs over the waters, the mighty waters, and so on. And the, set, the uh, psalm ends by celebrating the Lord has enthroned uh, himself over the forces of disorder and chaos, and thus is the only power worthy of glory, worship, uh, and true honor. And, and so it is God who orders and brings order to the world. Psalm 30. Psalm 30 is a psalm of thanksgiving. 
It celebrates God's faithfulness as experienced in the psalmist's delivery from what seems to be a near-death crisis. The structure of the psalm is pretty straightforward here. Uh, you get thanksgiving for deliverance, and then you get a call for others to join in thanks. Uh, a recollection of the crisis the psalmist has experienced. A uh, repetition of the petition that the psalmist has in the closing words of praise. So you get a key image, a key motif here is the psalmist uh, having nearly gone down to the pit is what verse three says. Uh, now the pit could literally be a well or a cistern. Perhaps this person was uh, almost thrown in there to suffer death. Uh, it certainly can also be a metaphor for death. But God has drawn the psalmist up. He has brought up the psalmist's soul. Uh, and uh, what prophet is there, the psalmist says, if I go down to the pit? Um, so you've got a contrast, contrasting images here in the psalm, despair of the crisis with the wonder of God's deliverance. You've got God's anger, but you've also got God's favor. You've got uh, the language of time contrasting for a moment, but also for a lifetime. Um, and uh, silence and praise is another contrasting, is other contrasting imagery. Um, and so the message of the psalm is summarized in verse 11, an almost kind of a creedal statement. Psalm 31. Um, here, this psalm alternates uh, between pleas for help uh, and also a profound expression of pain and expressions of trust and praise. We see these themes commonly in each psalm. Uh, as, the, as a whole, uh, the psalm moves from petition to praise to instruction. So um, we've got uh, um, a dominant theological note here, I would call it, of the psalm. Um, that explores what it means to entrust and commit one's life to God. Such a life will be duly marked, the psalmist says, on the one hand, by the opposition, there will be scorn of those uh, who reject the way of God. But on the other hand, there'll be hope uh, that those who are suffering can take the long view of life and rely on God in the face of persecutions and tribulations. So, that is where we are for the Psalms today. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you again that we can come to you in prayer just as the psalmist did so many centuries ago. We can offer to you our petitions. We can offer our praise. We can offer our um, assurances of our trust in you. We just thank you for uh, the fact that you are a God who does hear our prayers. You are a God who wants to hear our prayers and answer our prayers. We thank you for that in this day, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, hasta mañana.